Well, welcome everyone. My name is Cindy Huber. It's so nice to meet you. And uh, welcome to those of you that have joined us um, online tonight. Uh, we have people from all over the state of Wisconsin that have joined us, so it's uh, really kind of cool. Uh, happy World Kidney Day, by the way. Um, we, uh, this is one of the reasons the National Kidney Foundation reached out to our guest speaker tonight because it is an opportunity for our organization and organizations throughout the world actually to raise awareness about the importance of kidneys. So tonight uh, is a great opportunity for you to learn more about your own health from one of the um, best experts that I have had the pleasure of knowing and working with over the years. Uh, our organization is a statewide health charity, and we uh, one of the things that we do is provide education as well as support and information for um, those uh, individuals uh, that not only have kidney disease, but we do a lot of work with people that have diabetes, high blood pressure, and um, a lot in terms of public health. Tonight, you'll hear about some of those uh, efforts uh, and the importance of all how everything is connected in our health. But it's a real pleasure uh, for us to get started tonight and uh, welcome Dr. Vasudev. Thank you, Cindy, for the kind introduction. Can you guys all hear me? Yes. Wonderful. My, my name is uh, Bram Vasudev. I'm one of the transplant nephrologists, but I've been trained in kidney diseases as well. Uh, so I should be able to give you a, a good overview um, uh, in the next hour or so. We do have a wide audience. Uh, you know, the youngest amongst us is a fifth grader. Uh, and, and, and definitely there are other people who are older. Some of you I have taken care of in the clinic. So thank you for, uh, for coming here for the talk. Uh, I have kept the talk really as basic as I could. Uh, there are some medical studies that I will show you and I will explain uh, to you what uh, what the content of those slides are. Uh, and if you have any questions, you know, please feel free to write them down and I'll be happy to answer those questions for you at the end. Uh, I have included close to about 36 some slides uh, that is in the handout that was provided to you. So, you know, you can definitely write down your questions uh, if you have any questions uh, pertaining to that particular slide. Uh, and then we'll go from there. Give me just one minute. Let me put this on properly so that I don't have to hold this in my hand all the time. And then we'll start. All right. So I just want to give you a little bit of a background that in 2001, I got an opportunity to come to MCW to train for one year. I came from New York. I told everybody it's a one year sabbatical. I'm going to go to New York and come back. Um, and 18 years down the lane, I have not left this place. And I will tell you that the thing that kept me from preventing going back to New York was actually the people. You know, this concept of Midwest hospitality, I had never experienced in my seven years in New York. So I, I thank all of you uh, for, for all the wonderful experiences that I've had in the last 17 years. I have done a lot of good work at MCW. We've done a lot of good research. I was a training director for, for fellows. That means I personally was involved in training of at least about 20 to 30 um, doctors who wanted to become a kidney doctor and successfully graduated from our, our program. And uh, MCW does have a good reputation in, in the nation for kidney disease, for kidney transplant and so on and so forth. And you know, I call this an oasis. And if you look at the structure, it's, it's huge. And uh, there are very few hospitals that are actually as good as, uh, as, as this place that I'm fortunate enough to work. I want to thank uh, Cindy and, and all the people that, uh, you know, helped put this together. Uh, uh, if it was not for their hard work, we would not be here. What I'm going to do today is that I'm going to talk about a few things, you know, what, what kidney looks like, how, what kind of functions uh, does it perform, what are in general the diseases that affect the kidney? How do you prevent kidney disease? And, and how we as doctors help manage uh, people who do have, you know, some kind of a kidney problem. So, I 
I sure can. And I can maybe hold this closer. Is that better now? Huh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I hope so. Indeed, do I need to do anything else? All right. Okay. I'll try and talk louder and I'll walk around uh, to see if that helps. So, you know, I, I very frequently use a car as an example in my talks. And that's why this is my first slide that, you know, this is really what a human body is. Lots of things come together, work in harmony so that you can go from one place to another, right? Uh, and, and the way that our body is organized is at the smallest level, there are atoms and molecules that make up cells. Cells with similar function make a tissue. Tissue combines to make organs, and then all the organs come together to make our body work. Each organ system comprises of multiple different uh, tissues and organs that come together. So let's look at the gastrointestinal tract. It starts with, you know, pharynx, there's the food pipe, the intestine, the stomach, liver, gallbladder, pancreas, stomach, and so on and so forth. They all come together and help us digest food. Similarly, for, for the urinary system or the kidney uh, system, there are kidneys uh, which have a blood supply uh, there are tubes that carry the urine that the kidneys make to the urinary bladder. Urinary bladder stores urine for a certain amount of time. And then periodically we go make urine and get rid of the urine and the toxins that the urine uh, contains. So this is again a slide showing you how different organs come together. And the way that our body is designed, most of the organs are in our thorax and in our abdominal cavity. The arms and legs are principally bones and muscles, which help us move and so on and so forth. This is a, a diagram again showing the internal organs of the body. So if you were to remove the anterior abdominal wall, you would be able to see that there are this kidney, this spleen, there is liver on this side. All these blood vessels are supplying to various organs. This is the urinary bladder, the, the spine in the back. But in terms of the urinary system, as I, I uh, talked about earlier, it's essentially two kidneys, which are right here in the uh, posterior part of the abdomen. Kidneys are about the size of a fist. And from the kidneys come out two structures called ureters, which essentially bring the urine from the kidney into the urinary bladder. Urinary bladder can hold up to about 300 to 500 cc of urine. And when we have that sensation that the bladder is filled, we go out and make urine and get rid of all the extra water and the toxins uh, that our body wants to get rid of. I was telling you about the blood supply to the kidney and that is very crucial. So this is the main blood vessel in the abdominal uh, cavity called the iota. And you can see that this blood vessel comes, gives one branch to each kidney and then it goes down and divides into two branches and then these go into our leg. The kidney has filters. So each kidney has close to about one million filters. They are very small. Even if I were to bring a live kidney in front of you and cut it, you will not be able to see them with your naked eye. They're really, really small. Uh, and that's why one million of them can fit in, in, in one kidney. And basically what happens is that the blood goes into these filters. And I'll show you how these filters look like uh, under scanning electron uh, microscope. Uh, the filters clean the blood. The clean blood is then returned back via this blue structure called the renal vein. And it goes into the inferior vena cava and back into the body. And all the toxins and water that we want to get rid of comes via these two yellow tubes called ureters and lands up in the urinary bladder. And then we, of course, periodically make urine and get rid of these uh, toxins. This is how kidneys look like. They're like bean-shaped structures. As I said, they're about the size of a fist. Uh, and this is called the hilum of the kidney. This is where the blood vessels go in and the ureter uh, comes out. If you were to cut a kidney, 
this is how it would appear. Like you cannot see these filters. They're really, really small. And you can see that this is the area of the kidney where uh, mostly the filters lie. And then the central area is the area that basically collects the urine and puts it into the uh, ureter and then in, into the uh, urinary bladder. Uh, again, this is a diagram showing you the same thing, that the kidney gets blood through what is called as a renal artery, it brings the blood. This is where most of the filters are, and you can see this is where the blood vessels are ending. All the urine that is made is collected via these uh, pyramids or flask-like structures. It feeds into these, and then they take it down into the urinary bladder. We'll go more and more microscopic as, as I show you the rest of the pictures. Uh, this is again a picture showing you that the heart is pumping the blood. The blood goes into the renal circulation or into the kidney. And this is where I was showing you that these blood vessels become very small and this is where most of the filters are located. If you look at it a little bit more closely, you can see that as these blood vessels reach the surface area of the kidney, they divide into really, really small branches called afferent arterioles. And then these arterioles then feed into a filter. And I'll show you in a second how that filter looks like. So if you look under a scanning electron micrograph, and so this has been magnified like thousand fold, this is how the filter appears. It's basically a bag of blood vessels. Uh, this is another diagram depicting that same filter. You can see that these are blood vessels that go inside this filter. And how this filter works, it's, it's amazing, uh, the functioning of, of this in the sense that the blood goes into the filter, the blood vessels divide into small, small branches. And what happens is that the toxins leak out from this filter. Water leaks out from the filter. And some of the other things like salt, sodium, potassium, bicarbonate, so on and so forth, they all leak from this leaky filter and get inside this plumbing system called the tubule. And body has a wonderful system where what happens is that almost every chemical in the blood, you know, that's free in the blood, like sodium, potassium, toxin, so on and so forth, they all leak out into this plumbing system. Our body has made certain channels and receptors to reabsorb all the things that we need. So you need salt. So it will reabsorb like 99% of the salt that's filtered. You need potassium. So the potassium is going to be reabsorbed. But the toxins that you do not need in this plumbing system, there are no channels to reabsorb those toxins. So once these toxins land up into this pipe, they have no choice but to get out of the body. And that's a fantastic me mechanism if you think about it, like dump everything and then reabsorb back only the stuff that you need. It also allows us to regulate things. So let's say I have two normal kidneys. I have a 100% kidney function. And I decide that I am going to eat a cup full of salt every day. Within about two days, my body or my kidney will figure out that I am eating a lot of salt. And you know what it will do? It will stop reabsorbing the salt. It will filter it out and it will just throw it out. It won't reabsorb it. If I cut back on my salt intake, my kidney can reabsorb almost 100% of the salt that's filtered out by these regulatory mechanisms that exist in the kidney. And that's why kidney is a master chemist. That's why one day you can go eat McDonald's, a lot of salt, and your blood pressure will not necessarily go up in one day because if your kidney function is normal, within the next 24 to 48 hours, you will dump all that extra salt that you ate. The problem is if you do it every day, you know, then you will at some point exceed the limit uh, of, of probably what, what kidney can do, especially if you have reduced kidney function. So back to our car. Uh, so, you know, the topic of this talk is heart your kidney. So I wanted to touch a little bit about on the heart as well. Uh, so, you know, the car has an engine that generates power, right? Which, which rotates the wheels. Similarly, our body uh, needs blood and we have a pump. 
and it is amazing that this pump beats 72 times a minute for your entire life non-stop without resting this is what a beat of 72 or so per minute would imply it just does not rest and what happens if you look at it very closely uh, there are these three or these four vessels on the top uh, and you know two of these bring blood into the heart and two of them take blood out of the heart heart has four different chambers and i'm going to show you another cut section in a minute to to show you how it works and it has four different valves you can see this is one valve right here there is one valve right here one here and one more that you cannot see which is uh, on the back and these valves allow for unidirectional flow of blood and i'll explain you in a bit how how it does that so i as i mentioned to you that there are four chambers so what happens is that all the blood uh, that comes from various body organs arms legs so on and so forth comes into the body via these two vessels called the superior vena cava and the inferior cava. this is the blue blood this is deoxygenated blood the blood comes into the heart in the right atrium then it goes into uh, what is called as right ventricle then the right ventricle pushes that blood via pulmonary arteries into the lung the blood then goes into the lung gets oxygenated and then the oxygenated blood comes back on the left side into the left atrium from the left atrium it goes into the left ventricle and from the left ventricle it is pushed out into the iota to circulate in the rest of the body so this is a, uh, a diagram of the heart pumping blood blood has lots of things red cells white cells things that help blood clot like platelets it has nutrients it has electrolytes uh, and so and it has antibodies and all that stuff that we need to fight infection uh, and as i was telling you when heart uh, pushes the blood into organs uh, initially you know the vessels that are closer to the heart are bigger but as they go farther away from the heart they get smaller and smaller and this is a very good slide that shows you that let's say this is an organ where the blood is being supplied the main blood vessel is big and then the vessel gets smaller and smaller as it divides and at some point the vessels become very small and their caliber might be you know something like 10 to 20 microns that's it that only one red blood cell could pass through them at a time this is again a diagram that explains the same thing that i was telling you that the heart essentially pumps blood into you know various organs and different parts of the body and it is very important to understand and at least if you remember this thing from this diagram that as the vessels go further away from the heart they get smaller and smaller and we'll come back to that concept a little bit later as it pertains to you know kidney disease and so on and so forth this is again the same diagram showing heart pumping the blood into various organs uh, the intestine the kidney the leg uh, the organs use up the oxygen the nutrients so on and so forth and then the deoxygenated blood is returned back into the right side of the heart then it goes to the lung gets oxygenated again and this cycle continues for for our entire life moving on to the next thing as to what does kidney actually do for us uh, kidney does a lot of things and uh, you know many of you probably have normal kidney function many of you might have reduced kidney function and one of the things that you will all realize uh, is that if you drink a lot of water you make a lot of pee right if you drink less water then you make less pee and the urine is concentrated and darker and that capacity to regulate the fluid status or the fluid homeostasis in the body comes from the kidney kidney has a lot of receptors there are receptors in other part of the body as well that can figure out if we have the right amount of water or not in our body so if our kidneys are very healthy we can drink a gallon of water and get away with it because we'll pee that water out but if your kidney function is reduced let's say you have a transplant and your kidney function is 40 percent if you drink a gallon of water there is no way that you'll be able to get rid of that water and where will the water go it'll go in your legs 
And if you see people with, if you know, if any of you has kidney disease and if you've ever seen a kidney doctor, I can bet that whenever you go see the doctor, they would press on your leg to see if you have extra water because they know that if you have extra water, you're probably drinking too much water or at least more water than what your kidneys can get rid of. And that's why by gravity, it's accumulating in the legs. You lay down at night, the fluid is gone in the morning, but it's not gone out of the body. It just relocates in the upper part of the body. And you go around your usual day and it goes back into your leg again. So one of the things that kidney helps is to regulate fluid balance. Second thing is electrolyte balance. You know, for people with normal kidneys, you know, if, if they start eating like a bowl of potassium every day, the kidney will figure out there is extra potassium. It's not going to reabsorb the potassium from those uh, filters and the potassium will be peed out. So actually as doctors, and I'll tell you a trick that, that we use, if let's say you were my patient and you came and told me, nope, I just eat two grams of salt. I don't even make it 2.5, I'm very particular. All I have to do is I have to collect your urine for 24 hours and see how much salt is in it. And if there is 10 grams of salt, probably ate 10 grams of salt the day before because kidney will pee out all the extra salt that you're eating. This is assuming that your kidney function is more or less normal. If the kidney function is reduced and obviously some of these functions will not occur as they occur in normal people. But we can figure out, yes. Is there salt that you think you're unaware of? Right, so almost all foods have some amount of salt or sodium chloride in it. Uh, it is, it is in general, I will tell you that things that are natural, like fresh vegetables, fresh fruits and stuff like that, they would not have excess amount of salt, but anything that's in a tin can, anything that has a long life, uh, you know, long shelf life probably has salt because salt is used as a preservative. You know, if you have an open wound and you put it in seawater, you generally would not get an infection from you know, the common bugs that exist on the skin because seawater is so salty that not even bacteria can survive in that water. So salt, that's why salt is used as a preservative all over. Uh, but you're absolutely correct. Yeah, many, many places salt is hidden and, and then you don't see it. Acid-base balance is another thing that kidney helps with. So all of us, when we eat food, we metabolize food, uh, there are acids that are produced. There are many different kinds of acids that our body makes. And kidney helps to make bicarbonate, which neutralizes this acid. And, and that maintains an acid-based balance in our body. So people who have chronic kidney disease, they can accumulate this acid and their body pH might be a little bit lower than normal. Kidney also helps with waste removal. So, you know, going back to the exhaust of a car, you know, your car uses the gasoline and then whatever the byproducts of combustion are, they are excreted out uh, from the exhaust. So similarly, kidney excretes all the toxins that our body makes. Liver also helps to metabolize some of them, but kidney primarily helps to get rid of them uh, from the body. Kidney also has a lot of hormonal functions. So kidney produces a particular uh, hormone called erythropoietin. This erythropoietin goes into the bone marrow and tells the bone marrow to make red blood cells. So when people get kidney disease, many a times or most of the times, in fact, they become anemic. They don't have enough red blood cells because they are, the marrow might be normal, but they don't, they're not getting the signal from the kidney. Uh, there are lots of other things that the kidney does, like, you know, making the active form of vitamin D and so on and so forth. Uh, so it is a very, very important uh, organ in our body. So now comes the next question. That how do you know that you have kidney disease? And this is one of the biggest problem in my field, that many people have kidney disease, but they don't know it. So let's say you get a rash on your skin, right, and it starts to itch. You know, you might go to a doctor in a week and say, you know what, I have this rash and it might only be a one centimeter rash. It's not gotten very big yet, but you notice it and you bring it to somebody's attention. If you have significant blockages in your blood vessels in the heart, you will have chest pain. Or when you exert a little bit, you'll feel short of breath. So you will seek medical attention. Somebody gets a stroke, they'll get paralyzed. 
or even if they get a mini stroke, they'll have some symptoms from it that that will take them to a doctor. So what what about symptoms of kidney disease? And you know, this is one of my favorite slides. And I'm sorry, I'm going back to the car, but I have really found it that many people, especially guys, you know, connect very well <laughs> with this concept. So let's say you have a car and there is full tank of gas or half a tank of gas. And let's say I were to hide the meter. Would you be able to tell how much gas is there in the car? No, right? The car would just drive the same. Maybe when it reaches here and some of you might have cars that might beep or a red light would come up, then you would realize that, my gosh, I'm running out of gas. And that is a problem with kidney disease that until the symptom, until the kidney function really gets down to, you know, 20, 25% or somewhere in that range, most people don't have any symptoms. They might feel a little bit weak because they're anemic now and so on and so forth, or their blood pressure uh, might get up because they're drinking all this water and they can't get rid of it. So their pressure might go up, but you know, many at times high blood pressure is asymptomatic as well. Your blood pressure could be 160 and you won't feel it. So it's, it's unfortunately very asymptomatic, uh, which, which is not really good. And as I said, you know, this is when men, many people find out uh, that they have kidney problems. And it's not unusual for us to go to the emergency room because they call us that somebody's kidney is not working well. And you go and talk to the person and they say, you know, all I feel is a little bit tired, but I just came to the ER because I was feeling a little bit weak, nothing else. And when you do their tests, you find out that their kidney is working at like 10% or 12%, which is something like this. So what, what we as doctors do, you know, we are very cognizant of the fact that if we can do things that are less invasive and figure out what problem you have, that is better for you. So I, you know, some time ago came up with this rule to help uh, teach young doctors that if they get somebody who has a kidney problem, uh, how can they systematically go through that patient's problem and figure out what, what it is? So, you know, whenever you go to a doctor, especially if anyone you has kidney problem, you know, we'll take a very good history from you. You know, what medical problems do you have? What medicines you take? So on and so forth. We do a very thorough physical exam. It's very non-invasive. We can do certain blood tests and blood tests can help us figure out about kidney dysfunction. And we'll talk a little bit about it in a minute or two. Urine comes from the kidney and many a times looking at urine, we can predict what kind of kidney problem you might have. We can also do certain imaging tests that help figure out that somebody has kidney problem. You know, one of the classic case that I tell uh, people or at least my trainees is that one time we had a guy who came forward to donate his kidney to his brother. And he went through all the testing, you know, history, physical, blood tests, urine tests, everything was perfect. What we do is that before we take somebody's kidney out and put it in somebody else's body, we do a CT scan of their and just to make sure they have two kidneys, no surprises when we go in to take the kidney out. And lo and behold, you know, this guy was in his 40s and his CT scan showed that he had a two centimeter kidney cancer and was completely asymptomatic. He didn't even have blood in the urine, which typically people with renal cancer can have. And all his tests were normal, but the imaging picked up that cancer and instead of donating, he went and he had partial part of his uh, kidney taken out and it saved his life because it might have been asymptomatic. Now, kidney cancer is very rare. There are no guidelines that tell that everybody needs to get screening for it. But I'm just saying that imaging can sometimes really help pick problems that we may not have been able to uh, pick otherwise. And then uh, last but not the least, if we really can't figure out what kind of kidney problem we have, you put a needle in the kidney, take a piece out, look under the microscope, and that can really tell what kidney disease a person has. And then obviously based on that, we can figure out what kind of treatment they need and so on and so forth. So the history and physical exam, we talked about the blood test. So, so some of medicine is not rocket science. You know, some of it is complex, but some of it is definitely easy. And, you know, figuring out kidney problems is a very easy thing for us to do. So we, our muscles, make a particular product called creatinine. Uh, that product is made by the muscles and kidney is the only organ that excretes it out. Normal people, you know, 
average height, average weight, and so on and so forth. Kidney makes a certain amount and kidney pees out a certain amount such that the blood test for creatinine, normal blood test for creatinine would reveal the creatinine concentration to be one milligram per deciliter. So that would be ballpark of normal creatinine. Now, if somebody has less muscle mass, so let's say somebody is petite, Caucasian, woman, less muscle mass, in 80, obviously the normal creatinine for them would be less because if they have less muscle, they'll make less creatinine. Shaquille O'Neal would have a creatinine of two and that would be normal for him because he's such a muscular guy. He just makes normal, that higher amount of creatinine. So his baseline creatinine is higher. So it's different for different people, but the ballpark range is about one. So for us, it's very easy to figure out. We do a blood test. And if your creatinine is more than one, let's say appropriate for you should have been one, but it's more than one. We know that you have some kidney problems. That's why you are unable to pee the creatinine out. And that's why it's building up in the blood, right? We can also do certain other fancy tests, like we can collect urine for 24 hours and based on that exactly predict what percentage of kidney function you have and so on and so forth. But blood test is a very, very easy way. It's a very cheap test uh, and it's a part of the basic chemistry that you get when you go to a doctor. As I was mentioning to you, urine tests are also very helpful in, in figuring out. And when you give us a urine sample, these are the classic uh, typical things that we test it for, you know, protein, blood, uh, glucose. So somebody's diabetic, they might be peeing out glucose and we can pick out or know that they have diabetes based on that urine test. We, can lo we look for bacteria, we look for different kinds of cells and so on and so forth. And based on, you know, what the uh, urine uh, microscopy or urine analysis show, many a time we can predict what kind of problem somebody has. So let's say somebody's urine is very cloudy and they have a little bit of blood uh, and they have lots of white cells in their urine. We know that's a sign of a urinary tract infection. Uh, we also many a times take urine sample from people, spin it in a centrifuge, and then look at the sediment under a microscope. So let's say somebody has inflammation of their filters in their kidney and they're leaking out blood. This blood can come out through this plumbing system. And when we look under the microscope, we look, we see what are called as red blood cell casts. And that tells us that there is inflammation going on in the filters in the kidney. Many a times when people have a urinary tract infection, they have lots of white cells in this plumbing system. And those white cells can form clumps and come out in the urine. And looking at those clumps, we can tell that most likely person has a urinary tract uh, infection. And this is how these casts look like. So this is called a red blood cell cast. You can see the lot of red blood cells trapped in a, in a proteinaceous uh, matrix. Uh, this is what is what a white blood cell cast looks like. Again, it can be seen in people with urine infection or certain other kind of uh, kidney problems. Imaging studies are very, very helpful. You know, we, we cannot look inside your body with our eyes. So we really rely on these tests a lot and they're very helpful. So, you know, this is a classic uh, uh, scan finding of somebody with a disease called as polycystic kidney disease that people are born with this disease. There are a lot of cysts in their kidney. And when you do the imaging, you can see that this is what, an, this is where the kidney is, the white part and all these dark round things that you see, these are cysts in the kidney and people with polycystic kidney disease can have thousands of cysts in their uh, kidney, which prevents the kidney uh, from working. This is again another CT scan showing one kidney here, another kidney here. This is again a CT scan in a different section showing one kidney right here, another kidney right here. This is the liver, this is the uh, spleen. Uh, ultrasound of the kidney is also sometimes very helpful. There's plumbing problem in the kidney. Kidney cannot pee the urine out. The urinary tract gets very distended and we can very easily pick that up uh, by ultrasound. Ultrasound is a very non-invasive test. There's no radiation that's involved. It takes like 10, 15 minutes to do it. So we rely on this test very often uh, for certain kind of kidney problems. This is again a CT scan showing kidney with lots of cysts. So normally, you know, this whiter stuff, this looks like normal renal parenchyma or normal renal tissue. And then you can see all these cysts uh, in the kidney uh, on imaging. And then I said last but not the least, sometimes we have to put a needle in the kidney and figure out what kind of problem the person has. 
and we take a piece of tissue, um, slice it into very fine segments and look at it under the microscope. This is a typical um, biopsy sample. This is what a filter looks like. These are all the plumbing tissue around that. And this is how blood vessels look like under uh, the microscope. Uh, now moving on to prevention of uh, uh, kidney disease. So kidney diseases can be of many kinds. Yes, ma'am. So kidney stones can occur in two parts. Either they can occur in the tissue of the kidney and then they don't obstruct the plumbing system at all. Sometimes the stone is in the plumbing system of the kidney. And then it would be more in the central area than the peripheral area. And if it's obstructing, then there'll be a lot of swelling behind the area where the stone is stuck. And that is very painful. Like for those of you who've had kidney stones, uh, I mean, we sometimes say that that's as close to labor as men can come. It can be so painful. Uh, so kidney injury, you know, can be of two types. Uh, one can be acute kidney injury that, you know, something happens, you, you took a medicine, that medicine caused an allergic reaction in your kidney and your kidney goes down the drain. Or kidney dysfunction can be chronic. Like let's say somebody has high blood pressure, pressure is like, 160, 150, it's not 200, 250, but still elevated than normal. That high blood pressure slowly but surely will over a period of time cause kidney damage and we'll go over the mechanisms in a bit. So kidney injury again can be like, it can just hit you like a hammer or it can be slow chronic progression uh, of, of renal uh, dysfunction. And you know, when we, when we look at, when we try and figure out what kind of a problem or what kind of kidney problem a person has, we typically you know, look at it in a scientific way that either they have problems with blood supply to the kidney or we gave them some toxic drug that really hurt the tissue of the kidney or they have some problem with the plumbing system uh, of the kidney, which is the ureter, um, uh, prostate and so on and so forth. So many men, when they get older, uh, the prostate becomes bigger and it does not let the urine flow. So the urinary bladder then expands, the pressure from the urinary bladder is transmitted into the kidney and that can cause kidney damage. Stones can get stuck in the plumbing system and then if the urine cannot come out, all the back pressure onto the kidney can cause kidney damage. So a kidney cancer, Sure. So the question is that what else can cause people to have blood in the urine? So besides kidney stones, uh, cancer of the kidney certainly can lead to blood in the urine. And remember, I gave you that example of that guy. He had no blood, but he still had a two centimeter lesion. But many people, once the lesion goes beyond a certain amount, they can have blood in, in the urine. People who have polycystic kidney disease, the CTs and MRIs that I just showed you, sometimes those cysts have blood and they burst and the blood just goes down into the urinary plumbing system and we can have blood in the urine. So kidney can get affected by lots and lots of diseases. And that's what makes our job really hard because we just don't have to deal with one disease, but many, many kidney diseases. So this is a classic example of, you know, some of the different kidney diseases that can affect the tissue of the kidney. These are, many of them are medical names, but I just wanted to show that, show it to you that these are just some of the many diseases that can affect the tissue of the kidney. Kidney can also get affected by many other systemic diseases. That means that it's not primarily a kidney disease, but kidney is just an innocent bystander. And the classic example is hypertension or high blood pressure and diabetes. About 70% of people in this country whose kidneys have failed and they have ended up on dialysis, it is either because of diabetes or high blood pressure. And you know, before I move on, I just want to make sure that you understand the seriousness of this. You know, when somebody's kidneys fail and let's say the kidney function goes down to 5%, 6%, they have three choices. If they go on to dialysis, or they get a transplant or they choose to die. Because if the kidney doesn't work 
all the toxins and electrolyte abnormalities that will result will not let the body function. Our body has an electrical system. You know, that heart that I showed you that was pumping, it works because of an electric current. So if the electrolytes are all off, if somebody's potassium is very high or somebody has a lot of acid in the body, the electrical system will not work. And if they don't work, the heart will stop beating. And many people, you know, who don't wake up in the morning, that occurs because at some point, something triggered their electrical system in the heart to fail and their heart stopped beating. And heart stops, life stops, seconds. Like if you stop my heart right now, I will fall here within, within a matter of two seconds. So it is very vital to our survival. And that's why we you know, focus on all this stuff that keep your heart healthy, keep your kidney healthy, keep your blood vessels healthy, and so on and so forth. But kidney gets affected by a lot of problems. You know, Somebody who has liver failure, and let's say their liver stops working, their blood pressures typically go down, their body swells up, and the end result is that the kidney does not get blood because of liver failure. So liver failure will cause the kidney to fail. Similarly, when somebody has heart failure because they had a heart attack or something like that, and if they cannot pump blood to the kidney, kidney cannot work. It needs that blood. It's like your car. You know, if you don't put any gas in it, it's not going to move, right? So these are, these are some of the diseases that affect, but these two are the most important. So I was telling you that if somebody has kidney failure and they end up on dialysis now, do you know what? is the annual cost of dialysis in this country? Can anybody guess? The United States government pays for dialysis, okay? How much money do you think they spend per year on just dialyzing barely half a million people who are on dialysis in this country? Believe it or not, it's four zero, B as in boy, billion dollars per year. That's the cost of dialyzing people. And the government pays that cost from your tax money. So it is really worthwhile. And as I said, if 70% of the kidney disease is called by diabetes and hypertension, and if we control two diseases, we can bring down the number of people who need dialysis in this country, and that would save so much money to the system that can be invested in roads and highways and schools, just, just whatever else that you can think of. So it is really worthwhile to control these two diseases. And you know, I tell a lot of medical students that if somebody finds a cure for diabetes and hypertension, they would get a Nobel Prize for sure. Because, you know, while I cannot take you to the hospital from one room to other, but I make rounds in the hospital and I will tell you that every second room, room number one, classic example, 60 year old with history of high blood pressure and diabetes, had a toe ulcer and got admitted to the hospital for amputation. Second patient, maybe for pneumonia. Third person, 75-year-old, had uncontrolled high blood pressure, had a stroke, is in the hospital because of pneumonia, because of stroke. Every alternate patient literally would either have diabetes or hypertension. And if we control these two diseases, I sometimes joke and tell medical students, we can shut down half the hospitals in this country because most people who get into trouble long-term get into trouble because of these uh, two diseases. Now, there are various stages of kidney failure. In the past, you know, we used to call it mild, moderate, and so on and so forth. Now, based on the level of kidney function a person has, we divide uh, kidney diseases into five stages. So one is like really very mild kidney failure, Stage two is when the kidney function is between 60 and 90. Stage three is when it's between 30 and 60. Stage four is when it's 15 to 30. And then stage five, which is the severe renal dysfunction or severe kidney failure, is when most people end up requiring dialysis, uh, which is, and I'll talk to you a little bit uh, about dialysis as well in the end. But that means that the kidney function is really poor. And if you don't do anything about it, the person may not be able to live very long. I was telling you earlier, these are the causes of end-stage renal disease. And if you combine diabetes and hypertension together, it's almost 70% of kidney failure in this country is just from these two diseases. And these are completely preventable. 
if you control your blood pressure, if you control your diabetes, there is a very, very good chance you will not end up with kidney failure requiring dialysis. So some things that, that you cannot modify, you know, no matter what you do, and, and I'll show you some of these examples. So some people are born with this condition. It's one of the most uh, common uh, cause of you know, kidney failure besides diabetes, hypertension, and about one in a thousand people in this country, one in 500 to one in a thousand people are born with this disease called polycystic kidney disease. It's a gene that they inherit or they had some mutation uh, you know, during their, their growth, uh, which leads to the kidney coming like this. So if you remember, I showed you those bean-sized kidneys earlier on, that's what normal kidneys look like. This is classic polycystic kidney disease. And each kidney can have thousands of these cysts. And basically, they don't let the kidney work because of the pressure created by these cysts into, over the rest, to the rest of the uh, filter. So, you know, if you're born with this, there's nothing you can do. You know, you just have to wait it out at some point when kidney uh, function is very poor. You know, we offer you all the other options and so on and so forth. But there's nothing wrong that you did. You were just born with this. Similarly, many people have kidney stone disease. This is actually a collection of stones from one of the doctors who over the years operated and collected stones and, and, and he showed all the different varieties of stones that, uh, that people can have. And again, this is, you know, many a times, this is something that you're born with that causes you to have increased risk of forming uh, kidney stones. Modifiable things. So there are some things that, that you can do and there is an old saying it says you know a man is as old as his arteries so if you go back and think about some of the things that i told you or the pictures that i showed you heart is supplying blood to all the organs if you have certain diseases uh, that affect the blood vessels ultimately all the organs will get affected at some point. You know, some organs might get affected early, some organs might get affected late. Diabetes, hypertension or high blood pressure and smoking. These are three classic things that typically damage the blood vessels and makes the blood vessel thick. It makes the wall of the blood vessel thick. So when the wall of the blood vessel gets thick, the heart cannot supply organs because now the roads are really narrow. So there'll be congestion of traffic, people or, you know, the end organs will not get blood supply. And some of the organs that typically get damaged sooner rather than later are our brain. So people who have high blood pressure, um, they have a higher risk of getting strokes. Uh, heart blood vessels can get damaged by these conditions and people who have high blood pressure or diabetes have a higher incidence of getting heart attacks. People who smoke typically will have higher incidence of heart attacks and so on and so forth. So these are all sort of modifiable factors, uh, if you will. Remember I had showed you that kidney is basically a bag of blood vessels. So if diseases like diabetes, hypertension, affect blood vessels, it is not a surprise that 70% of people who have complete failure of their kidney function requiring dialysis, it's because of those two diseases that I, I mentioned about. If my blood pressure is 150 or 160 and I'm young, there's a very good chance I would not feel it. The time I would feel the pressure is when the pressure mostly gets above 200 range. How many of you have had your blood pressure checked? You have. You know, sometimes when they inflate that sphygmo manometer, and sometimes it really hurts, right? And it hurts, you know, the moment that they push beyond 180, 190, it really starts to hurt. So think about it, that when 180 millimeter of mercury from outside is hurting your strong arm, when the pressure inside the blood vessel is 180, how would your vessel be feeling? You will get a headache, right? Because the pressure is so high, it's distending this blood vessel. 
So high blood pressure obviously is not good. You know, if you feel the pain outside, imagine the pain that your vessels would be feeling inside. Now we don't have nerves, so we don't feel the pain inside the nerves. That doesn't mean that the damage is not occurring. The damage is definitely occurring. And you know, we we can't we, we cannot blame the society. I think a lot of it is the choices that that people make. You know, there are billboards uh, showing an advertisement that you can eat four burgers for three dollars. Uh, <laughs> so there's one end of the campaign. You know, if you drive, I mean, half the billboards I think are food, right? I mean, thank goodness they've stopped advertising for smoking, but, and it used to be, right? In the past, we used to see so many billboards of Marlboro and so on and so forth. Thank goodness we've gotten rid of them. But, you know, the society is doing the best it can. Somebody is funding this. This is not cheap. I mean, it costs money to put these kind of billboards and they're showing that, you know, this is what high blood pressure looks like. And you can see this guy has had a heart bypass surgery because high blood pressure damaged the vessels in his heart and he ended up in this situation. I was telling you earlier that high blood pressure does, uh, you know, it, it affects lots of organs, but some more than other. And, and the typical victims are brain, so people can get strokes, uh, they can lose their vision if the high blood pressure causes them to bleed inside their eye. Uh, it can definitely cause heart attack, heart failure, it can cause kidney dysfunction and, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and as I mentioned a couple of times earlier, it's the most important or most common risk factor for heart attack and stroke. There are many people, you know, you would think that at this time we would have gotten it and everybody would have their pressures in control, but that's not true. You know, almost 30 to 40% of people don't have good control of blood pressure. Uh, and a pressure, you know, generally greater than, you know, uh, 150, 160, especially in people who are older, uh, is a significant uh, risk factor. Now, how many, many of you have children and recall of the time that you took your children to a doctor and let's say they check their blood pressure. How often do, do kids have high blood pressure? Very often, right? There's one children's hospital in Milwaukee, right? There are 20 adult hospitals. And, and the reason is that as your car gets older, you, know, you will need to take it to the mechanic more often, right? You know, see, when you buy a car, remember they say 50,000 four-year warranty. The reason they say that is they know that nothing will happen to your children for the first 30, 40 years of their life. Nothing will happen to the car for five years. It's only after that when things will go wrong that the warranty goes away, right? So as we get older, and this is a slide that shows you that data that this, uh, if you look at the top one, this is a men, uh, or this is data from men. These are people in 18 to 39 years of age group. These three bars represent people who are in 40 to 60 years of age group, and these are people who are older than 60. The red line uh, depicts people who are Caucasians, the uh, purple line or bar depicts people who are uh, African Americans, and this is Mexican Americans. And as you can see, that younger people, the incidence or prevalence of uh, sorry prevalence of high blood pressure is very low. You know, even in up to up to this age group, the numbers are less than 10, 15 percent or so. But as people get older, the incidence of high blood pressure goes up. And we typically call it in most cases, like more than 90 some percent of cases are what are called as essential hypertension. Or we don't know what the cause is, but most likely the cause is that the blood vessels get stiff. So when your heart beats, when your blood vessels are young, when you are young, they are very compliant, they expand. So the pressure inside does not go up. As you get older and the vessels get stiffer, they can't expand, so the pressure inside goes up. Does it make sense? And same thing for women. You know, Most people who have high blood pressure are older. And you can see that the incidence can touch almost about you know, 70, 80% in people who are more than 60 years of age. There are some things that you can do for sure. You know, dietary modification like eating less salt 
you know, controlling the body weight. And, and this is a slide that shows, you know, some of the interventions that you can do to help reduce your blood pressure on your own without needing any medicines. So weight reduction, you know, the DASH diet, sodium restriction, some amount of physical activity. So, you know, let's say you walk for like a couple of miles, you know, your pressure might go up a little bit when you're walking because you're exerting. But after that, when you relax, the pressure actually does come down a little bit. You know, it won't go from 180 to 120, but it might go down by about five or six points. And that's why they say that, you know, exercise at least a little bit is, is good. And same thing for alcohol, you know, reducing the alcohol consumption can help reduce the blood pressure a little bit. Now, there are many studies that have been done looking at, you know, how much medications people need for good blood pressure control, despite a lot of those other interventions that I told you. And the, this is the list of all the studies that have been done, which wanted to achieve this range of blood pressure, you know, 130, 140 range. And you can see that in most of these studies, the average number of medications people needed to control their pressure was close to about two to three. Uh, so, you know, if despite all these risk factor modifications, you know, when despite that the pressure is not controlled, you still could end up needing two or three blood pressure uh, medications. Uh, there is 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 an uh, uh, organization uh, called the Joint National Commission. There are a group of experts that get together every so often and they come up with guidelines in terms of, you know, what is the right blood pressure and so on and so forth. And I'll give you the gist of it because we've been struggling with this for many, many years now as to what is the right amount. And I will tell you, when I was a medical student in early 1990s, my professors used to teach me that the normal blood pressure is a person's age plus 100. So if you are 80 years old, 180 is good blood pressure for you. If you're 90, 190 is good for you. If you're 60, 160 is good for you. And for many years, we did that. And then we saw, you know, a lot of people are having strokes. A lot of people are having heart attacks. And then science said, you know what, wait, wait a minute. Like we, you know, normal blood pressure is 120 over 80. And then at some point we were saying 180 systolic is normal. So the science then said, no, you know, we have to reduce it. And they wanted everybody's blood pressure to come down to like 120 range. So, you know, we did all the interventions, lose weight, stop smoking, do this, do that, take pills, get your blood pressure down to 120. But when you bring the blood pressure of an 80 year old person to 120 and their blood vessels are a little thicker because of age, many people start falling down because they were so dizzy. And then we started dealing with bone fractures because an old woman fell down because she took her blood pressure meds, as the doctor said, and now she has a hip fracture and she's in a nursing home. So then the sign said, you know what, wait a minute, we, I think we've swung the pendulum too much in the other direction. And now people have sort of settled for something like this. And, you know, there's... There are different studies which might say things a little bit different, but, but generally the ballpark is that you know, if you sort of maintain your blood pressure more like 130, 140 type range, depending on your age, if you're older, you know, you're allowed to probably be closer to 140, even 150 sometimes. And if you're a little bit younger, less than 60, you know, we try and aim for at least about 130 type kind of range, not 110, but you know, 130, 140 kind of range. That seems at least at this point, to be the right number and you know i have to tell you guys that you know a lot of people expect a lot from us you know somebody was telling me the other day there's a very complicated kidney disease people have been studying it the last 40 years we finally 10 years ago figured out why it occurs like what is the genetic problem that causes it and the other day i was talking to somebody and the patient was so angry at me that why have you not figured out the solution and, you know, I kind of said, well, you know, we are trying. I'm not a scientist, but I know that many colleagues of mine are working at it. I thought that, you know, we have not even figured out how to solve traffic congestion at the zoo interchange. And you are asking me to find a cure for such a rare disease, which we are still trying to, you know, put our arms. I mean, you have to give time to science. Science cannot make you live 200 years by next year. Maybe 100 years from now, it might ex extend your age. But right now, I mean, we've done a very good job. I was telling somebody the other day, the average life of a human was in 40s 100 years ago. 
women used to start getting pregnant at age 13, 14. They would get pregnant, have the baby, either the baby would live or die. Then two years later, they would have another baby. And at some point, you know, they might lose blood during childbirth and die. Didn't survive. Men went to war and died. Now we have so many people who are in their 80s and 90s. I have a friend who used to work in Hawaii. He said it was not unusual at all for a 90-year-old person to drive to his clinic in their own car. 90-year-old. So, I mean, we have extended age. Science has extended age. But, you know, a lot of it has to occur from the society too. You know, we keep telling people, control your sugars. Control your blood pressure. Don't be overweight. All that kind of stuff. But you know, people have to follow those instructions. That's how you will you will uh, get uh, get results. The other thing that's very important to understand is that unlike a pneumonia, say I get a pneumonia, you're my doctor. You give me antibiotics for three weeks. Pneumonia is gone. I can stop taking the antibiotics, and I probably won't see you for another year. Right. With hypertension, you can do this. You can say, I'll take my medicines for one week. My blood pressure is normal now, and now, therefore, I can stop taking the medicine. It's a chronic condition. There is no cure for it yet. You know, we can just put a Band-Aid right now. Uh, yes, sir. So, you know, the question is that let's say somebody is, is diagnosed with high blood pressure and with diabetes uh, or, or but, but you develop them now, you don't have diabetes. Right. So let me go back to this slide. So, you know, if you are sort of this pre-hypertensive that your blood pressure is sort of going up. The doctor says, well, don't gain more weight, lose some weight. Maybe your blood pressure will get better. So if you do these dietary modifications and you reduce your weight to near normal, which is a BMI of, let's say, 19 to 24, you could see an improvement of anywhere between 5 to 20 millimeter of mercury in your systolic blood pressure. Definitely it can come down. And I'll give you a classic example. My wife was about 140 some pounds. Uh, when she was pregnant, uh, she was diagnosed with gestational diabetes. She was on close to about 80 units of insulin per day, eight zero. That's a lot of insulin. And her doctor said that, wow, until you make some drastic change in your life, you are gonna be diabetic. And my wife's dad is a diabetic and she did not want to be a diabetic. So the moment she delivered, she went on an unbelievable kind of a diet, like literally reducing her calories to 1,000, 1,200, using my fitness app and counting every single molecule of sodium and calorie that she ate. And she got her weight down to 120s and the diabetes never came back. And when she went back to the, for follow-up to the endocrinologist, they said, well, it's because you lost those extra pounds and she's been free of uh, diabetes for almost about 10 years now. So yes, if you lose weight, type 2 diabetes can certainly get better or even go away for sure. So there are two kinds of, and I'll touch a little bit on, on, on diabetes, that there are two kinds of diabetes. One is called type 1 and the other one is called type 2. The science has finally uh, they have a good theory about type 1. So uh, if you know anybody with type 1, the type 1 is typically, you know, the 10-year-old kid is not feeling well, making a lot of urine. They take them to the hospital and they found the sugars to be 1,000, right? And they get diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And that basically is because of lack of insulin. So insulin is one of the hormones made by our pancreas. And I'll show you some slides a little bit later as to how it works. But but it helps keep the blood sugar levels down. So 
now science has figured out and type one is very sporadic like you might have no family history of diabetes and suddenly your kid might end up being a type one diabetic and they would need insulin from day one and after a lot of research one of the theories that has come out with is that when kids are growing up you know, a lot of kids get these viral infections and so on and so forth and in general these infections are very good because they make us immune so let's say I get a viral infection. Let's say for the sake of discussion, I get chickenpox as a five-year-old. The disease will be very mild. You know, I'll have a little bit of fever. I'll have some rash. It will go away in a couple of days. If I never have gotten chickenpox in my life and I get it as a 50-year-old, I will be sick. I could even die from it. It can be so severe, right, at that age. But in kids, that they get viral infection every week in 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 winter time, and those those we think are protective from you know getting sick later in life. But one of the hypotheses is that when people are growing up, they get exposed to certain things, certain antigens. They could be viruses. They could be something in the environment which we may or may not know, and they make antibodies to those particular antigens, and those antibodies cross-react and damage the insulin producing cells in our pancreas, in the pancreas of those kids. And when the, all the insulin producing cells die, they can't make any insulin. And then they get type one diabetes. Type two is different. Type two is more what, what we think is called as insulin resistance. Like I gave you the example of my wife. My wife had gestational diabetes because the placenta, in simple terms, let's say it neutralizes the insulin. So she needed so much insulin to control her sugars and the insulin that her body was making was not enough. So she had to take exogenous insulin. But the moment she delivered, the placenta was out. So the organ that was causing insulin resistance was out of her body. So whatever insulin that she was making started to work. And then she aggressively lost weight. And that allowed her to have even less insulin resistance. And she she's been able to stay away from, from, from diabetes. So type two is more like an insulin resistance problem. So if you think about it in a way that this is the stomach, the food, especially the carbohydrates that we eat, get absorbed into our bloodstream. Based on the amount of carbs that we eat, our pancreas secretes this insulin, which is the blue color molecule. So it gets released into the circulation as well. The more sugar you eat, the more insulin will be released by your pancreas as long as it's working okay. They'll both go into the bloodstream. The blood will end up at some point in close to cells. And if you look at this diagram, this is a normal condition that the insulin sits on this receptor on the surface of the cell. And when it sits here, it allows the sugar to go inside the cells. And then the sugar is obviously used up for the functions of the cells. And your blood sugar comes down because the sugar went inside your tissue, be it your muscles, be it you know, other tissue and so on and so forth. If you do not have insulin, the sugar will not go inside your cell. So either you don't have insulin like type 1 di diabetes or if you have insulin resistance, the insulin, say even if it sits here, it doesn't work. The sugar will not go inside the cell. So when you check your blood sugar, it's going to be high. right? That's why you take exogenous insulin to make it sit here so that the sugars can come down. So anybody who has high sugar, they inject insulin, sugar goes down, and that's the, uh, the, the mechanism. So it, the system is doing a lot. You know, Cindy has brought like a bunch of flyers in the back, uh, brochures and so on and so forth, basically, and that's what she does. Goes to, you know, camps and churches, and she was even thinking of going outside McDonald one day, but somehow, <laughs> But but she's conveying this message, you know, control your sugar, control it, control your blood pressure, and there's a very good chance that you'll have to stay, you can stay away from us. You know, I am here, right? I mean, you all know that I earn by working in a hospital. And I'm sitting outside the hospital telling you how to not come to the hospital. Like, how much more honest can we be? <laughs> Right? We don't need your money. We just want you to have a good life. Stay away from us if you can. And there is a way. Keep your body healthy. You will not need to take your car. Right? Back to the car. <laughs> All right. Management of kidney disease. You basically figure out why you have a kidney problem. Once we figure out... 
Very good question. Excellent. So the her question is that do people who are older have chronic kidney disease? So you know if you if you look at your skin now, it's a little different than what it was when you were 25, right? Correct? So as we age, just like our hair get white, just like our skin develop wrinkle uh, wrinkles all our body organs sort of go down. Does anybody know what is the peak of human life? At what age do we peak and after that it's all a downhill? 25, yes. 25 is the peak. And after, <laughs> after that, it's, it's a downhill. 25 is what, what most, most people, you know, there's no well way to prove it, but that's what most scientists think that that's really the peak of life. But what, what I meant is that as you get older, function, of your body organ goes down and generally let's say the knee function let's say i am 40 my kidney function is a hundred percent right now for every year beyond 40 my kidney function will go down by ballpark about one percent per year this is if i have no other medical problem my blood pressure is good my kidney is healthy so by the time i reach the age of 100 my kidney function would be down to ballpark about 50%. But remember, to drive your car, the tank does not need to be full. Half a tank will work until you're so, planning to live till 200 years of age. <laughs> so I guess my question is this. Um, my husband and I both have like 76 and 77 GFR. And we don't have any of the stuff you talked about. So my question is, I mean, we're healthy. We have, you know, 110 over 60 blood pressure, no diabetes, so none of that stuff. What is like the average of like a 60 year old? Because we're considered stage two. So, so as I said, if your normal kidney function is 100%, and at the age of 40, you start losing 1% per year. By the time you are 60, your kidney function would be ballpark about 80%. Okay, so that's normal. So don't, I mean, don't be worried because you're, I mean, the thing that's interesting is that you considered stage two, you have kidney disease. And you're saying that that's normal? Yeah, that's correct. All of us, all of us have wrinkles when we are 80. So if the dermatologist says that that's a disease, well, then we all have it. Yes, ma'am. I have stage three kidney. I'd like to know what I can do to prevent going to stage four. I do have high blood pressure, but I have two medications for it. So the best thing that, that you can do is to, you know, keep your pressures in control. Don't take things that can potentially hurt the kidney more like you know some people they have pain they end up taking like a five pills of motrin every day for like a month like motrin excedrin motrin you know a lot of these pain pills that are over the counter a uh, lot of these things can hurt the kidney so if you don't have a kidney problem and once in a while you take motrin you know that's fine but you can't eat it like multivitamin three times a day it, it definitely has been shown that people who chronically take NSAIDs they can have reduction in kidney function. You know, I, I cannot tell you offhand what, what it is in terms of the details of the diet, but we can definitely, I don't know if you've gotten any flyers for DASH diet or not, but. Yeah. 
So it's basically like a heart healthy diet, you know, less sodium, more more fruits, and vegetables, and and for people who do not have kidney problems, you know, there is if there is some potassium in that, that is also thought to help lower the blood pressure a little bit. But if you have severe kidney disease, then obviously you cannot take a lot of potassium because your kidney will not be able to pee it out, and then you will have. And there's a very good chance that even your primary care doctor's office might have a dietitian who might be able to sit down with you for half an hour, 45 minutes, give you a list of things that are healthy. One of the things I've been told by uh, Lessons of Nutrition is drink the gut, I'm not drinking enough water. How does that work? Yeah, you know, this, this, is, this is a problem that we kind of face every day at our work this conflicting advice about water so remember in the beginning of the talk i told you that if your kidney function is 100% 80% you know even 70 60% you drink a gallon of water there's a very good chance you'll be able to pee it out but if your kidney function is low let's say your creatinine which is that marker of kidney function that we talked about is 3 and let's say for whatever reason, let's say it goes up a little bit and you drink a gallon of water and dilute that creatinine in your blood because now you have extra water, your creatinine will come down. But that is lowering of creatinine. It's a falsely low creatinine because of dilution. You added a lot of water to the salt, so the salt level came down. A few days later, when you get rid of that water, if it is extra water, then your creatinine will go back up to that range. And generally, we tell people that if you have swelling in your legs, uh, don't drink too much water because if you can pee it out, your swelling will just get worse. And then some people end up taking water pills to get rid of water. So they're drinking a gallon of water and then they're taking lots of pills to get rid of the water. Well... Yeah. You know, one of my friends uh, was a part of this uh, study called the Framingham Heart Study in Connecticut to collect a lot of data on the habits of people. And it's been a, it's a study that's been going on for about a hundred odd years. They have multiple generations of families in that Connecticut area that they follow on yearly, every two year basis. And this friend of mine came up with some data that said that from that study and to a lot of people, hundreds of thousands of people, that, that Coca-Cola is or any dark soda is not very good. It predisposes to lots of problems, metabolic syndrome in general, which is, you know, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and so on and so forth. And it was a good study. Um, and and he, he had a lot of people from companies who personally called him and got very angry at him for publishing something like that. So in general, I will tell you that these, the dark sodas, sugary sodas are good. One of the component in these dark soda is, is phosphoric acid, which gets into the body and converts into phosphates. If somebody has a problem, they cannot get rid of phosphorus. And if you drink sodas that are high, phosphorus your blood phosphorus level goes up when your blood phosphorus level goes up it combines with calcium to form calcium phosphate and that can calcify the blood vessels of of people over a course of time it doesn't happen in one day but over a long period of time so in general you know you it'd be very hard to get this out of a doctor that soda is good so you know that comes to vaping. You know, 
20 of effort dropped with smoking prevalence amongst people who are 80. 33% down to 10%. A lot of effort made by society. Good people like you all. 33 to 10%. Somebody introduced vaping and now is at almost 35% amongst high school grad people. So diet soda, if you ask my personal opinion, and I will tell you that, you know, don't take this advice as your doctor's advice. I'm just telling this to you in good faith. As a doctor, I'm not an expert in it, but I will tell you that I don't drink it. We don't keep any soda in our house. You know, if somebody wants, they can get, get fresh we can make mango juice at home, all that kind of stuff, but 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 nothing, nothing like that. See, the issue is if you go back and look at the artificial sugars that exist in all these, uh, uh, you know, diet stuff. These studies were for a very small duration. They did six months of studies or something like that, and said that well, they look safe, and then these things got into the food chain. Nobody knows what happens if you take aspartame for 10 years. Nobody. And the companies, tell me one company, go Google and tell me one company that's doing a study where they're looking at effect of aspartame over 10 year period of time. Nobody will invest that kind of money. It will cost millions and millions of dollars to do those studies. So they don't. And they're very difficult to do. See, if you, if you keep a food log over a year, you would have eaten like thousand different kind of things. How do you tease out that the cancer that I have is from aspartame? I ate so many different kind of things. In general, we tell everybody, you know, as natural as you can stay, you know, as close to the garden as you can stay, that is probably the best, best thing. Yes, ma'am. You know, I really would I'm a kidney doctor, <laughs> so I know in general, if you were to ask me as a doctor's advice, I would say we tell everybody stay as close to the garden as you can. Fresh fruits, vegetables. I, I just want to add a comment about uh, diet soda. There was a very recent study, a large study, that um, showed that diet soda, water for consumption, definitely shortens one's life. Uh, I don't remember the source. I read this in the past few days. I just but it was you, it you was saw like the same one. Thirty-two percent higher risk. Yes. Than yes. Women. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> But I would not be surprised. I, but I will tell you that it's very hard to do these studies because people eat so many different things. You know, when we do scientific studies, we, the thing that we want to study is the only variable. In humans, there are like a thousand variables. So to tease that out is, is, is a little bit hard. This is, this is something that happens if kidneys fail. And this is very painful process to go through that if kidneys fail and we have no choice but dialysis so that people can live. They have to be connected to this machine called the dialysis machine three times a week. They go to a dialysis center. We have a way to get access to their blood. The blood is taken out from their body. It goes through this machine. It's cleaned and then it's back into the body. And it's, it's a very painful process in the sense that it's very hard on the body. And most people at the end of dialysis don't feel good. They feel very tired, very fatigued because all the water and toxins that they've accumulated in 40 some hours, uh, we take it out in three hours. So that disequilibrium makes people feel really sick. And then, you know, uh, if, if dialysis is not the best choice and they do have organs available, we can do a kidney transplant uh, for them uh, but that means getting an organ from another person, taking medicines twice a day, doctor visits. It's just not worth it. You know, the cost of dialysis is about $100,000 per year. It's very expensive. Transplant is, you know, very expensive in the first year. But even after that, it's about twenty, thirty thousand $30,000 a year in terms of, you know, cost of medicines, blood tests, so on and so forth. 
So these are very expensive. They are life sustaining treatments, no doubt, but they are very expensive. And if you can take care of your health so that you don't need this, I think one, one should. Thank you so much for your time. Could you speak a little bit to kidney stones, uh, the factors and use hereditary, uh, heredity a factor in what could you potentially do to prevent them? Certain types of fluids, I mean, is it increasing the acid or did I get that wrong, like lemonade or whatever? So that's, that's a very good question about kidney stones. So, you know, remember if when I was showing you that non-modifiable factor thing, Besides polycystic kidney, I showed you a bunch of stones. Uh, so it is correct that some people have a higher risk of forming kidney stones. Certain, there are many different factors that can lead to formation of stones. Some of them have to do with family history. So, you know, some people have a family history that they pee out more than normal amount of calcium in their urine. And when that happens, which is called as, you know, hypercalciuria, this calcium can deposit in kidney because remember that plumbing that I showed you, it can deposit there and form a kidney stone. The surgeons have higher incidence of kidney stones. Anybody can guess why? People who go into surgery, risk. Yeah. they go to the operating room. Sometimes they're standing for 12 hours. Neither do they drink, neither do they go to the bathroom. So the urine is always very concentrated, especially on the days they are in the OR, which might happen three times a week. And that's why, see, even though I, I told you about the water intake that, you know, if, if you're a normal kidney function, you drink a gallon, sure, you'll be able to pee out a gallon. Whether you need a gallon of fluid or not, I really don't think so. You need to make a gallon of urine. But, you know, even if you make a liter, liter and a half of urine, it, it's good enough. But if you have stones or if you have family history of kidney stones, one thing that has been certainly shown to reduce the incidence of stones is maintaining a good urine output, like even up to three liters a day. And basically what happens is that there is something in the urine that predisposes to these chemicals coming together and crystallizing in the kidney. And if you dilute them out, they won't crystallize together. So in medical terms, we call it super saturation of crystals. But if you dilute, dilute the urine and they don't get super saturated, then your risk forming stones will drastically go down. Just water or lemonade? Yes. Like so for certain kind of stones, definitely, you know, uh, lemonade and stuff like that, which have, you know, citric acid in it. And it helps neutralize some of the uh, things in the, in the urine and that prevents stone formation as well. But what what we figure out or how we figure this out is we collect your urine for 24 hours. We do a test called as litholink and we look at the metabolic profile of your urine. So if you have a lot of oxalate, let's say in your urine, you know, we can cut down your diet and you get rid of oxalate rich food and your oxalate will go down and you won't form stone. If you have less, you know, citric acid and stuff like that in the, or less citrate in the urine, then we can ask you to take that and that reduces your risk of forming stones or crystallizing within the plumbing system. Yeah, if you have family history, it's definitely worthwhile getting a little link one time to make sure that your metabolic profile of the urine is, is not pre going to predispose you to stones. Although I will tell you that if you are in your 50s and 60s and if you haven't had a stone, there's a very good chance you won't make it. You won't make one now at this age. Many people who have family history will get stones in their 20s and so on and so forth. All right, thank you so much for coming and I'll be happy to answer any other question that you have. So I, I wanna thank you all for coming since uh, someone uh, might inadvertently have taken my uh, sign-in list in